Welcome, everyone. I am glad that so many of you can join today. My name is Faustine Auger. I am sec the secretary of the EORE Advisory Group. And on behalf of the EORE Advisory Group, it is my pleasure today to kick off this EORE Hour. So for those who joined for the first time, the EORE Hour webinar series is an initiative that was launched at the end of 2021 by the EORE Advisory Group. And the webinars takes place the last Wednesday of every month for which we have volunteers to present on a chosen topic. So far in 2021 and 2022, we had five webinars organized, and this is the first one for 2023. So for those who could not attend or who would like to review past webinars, uh, I invite you to watch the recordings that are available online on the EORI Advisory Group YouTube channel. And we'll put the links in the chat very soon. Today's topics is on exploring new resources for digital EORE. And this EORE webinar is hosted by the digital EORE task team of the EORE advisory group. I am personally very excited about this webinar as it is the first one in a very long time. And I am glad to see so many participants present today to explore and discuss around the subject of explosive ordinance risk education, but most particularly digital EORE. We hope that today's presentations will introduce new useful resources to you and perhaps inspire you or help you overcome some recurring challenges that you may encounter in your projects. Today's webinar will be one hour and will be followed with a 15-minute networking circle. This networking circle will give you the chance to make connections with other professionals working around the world on EORI. So I hope you will be able to stay on for this last part too. So before handing over to Sebastian from MAG, co-lead of the Digital EORI Task Team of the Advisory Group, who will introduce a bit further the work of the team and the next speakers, I will just share some few final logistics notes. So we kindly ask you to keep your mics mute during the presentations, and we invite you to submit your questions directly in the chat as we go. There, we, there will be a Q&A session after the presentations of the different speakers, taking up the questions raised in the chat. In case all questions submitted are not addressed due to time constraints, the remaining questions will be compiled and answered in writing by the speakers after the webinar. And uh, we will circulate the responses uh, through the EORI Hour mailing list. So as for previous webinars, this webinar is recorded, except for the networking circle part that will happen after the presentations and the Q&A and uh, the recording will be available online on the Advisory Group YouTube channel at a later date. If you have any technical issues, please do not, do not hesitate to contact me or my colleague Ines Burki in the chat for assistance. And I will now hand over to Sebastian and I wish you all a fruitful and inspiring EORI hour. And Sebastian, the floor is yours. Thank you and uh, very good afternoon from my side of the world. Good morning, wherever you are. Good evening. And I'm um, happy to start this EORI hour after the nice introductions. And um, let's start a short um, presentation, which I want to share. And I need to find it. Okay, here we go. Okay. So I am working for MAG. I am the head of programs, performance, and learning unit, a new job. And um, in, I've been the co-chair of the EORI advisory group in the beginning, jointly with Hugues Orange. And this job is now done by Furat Al-Markawi from, from Head of Trust. And we are a group of, um, let's see if this is working. Why is it not? Okay. Why is it not working like it should be? Sebastian, you just need to click on your first slide on the left. Yes. And then you can put on full screen and it should work. Yes. Okay. And then I click again. Yeah. Okay. So here you see it. So UNICEF and Hated Trust at the moment are the co chairs. Geneva Center is doing the secretariat function. And um, then we have the core um, HMA, Humanitarian Mine Action Operators, plus um, UN agencies besides UNICEF interested in supporting the subject, that's UNHCR and UNDP and UNMAS, of course, 
but we also have two alternating um, national mine action centers. So the Lebanese mine action center and the Colombian one at the moment. Plus we have observer status with the ICRC and uh, the IOM UN migration as an associate member. So that gives you an overview of who we are. And the main reason for us to exist is basically to, to provide overall guidance and identify ways to improve the integration, effectiveness, efficiency, and relevance of explosive ordnance risk education within the broader sector. So to really push up URE in the, agen in the agenda and um, professionalize the ways we are working, elevate the profile. So today we are focusing on digital URE. And uh, you will hear from three subgroups. And um, one is working on partnerships. The second one is uh, on micro content. And the third one on M&E. So you will get the details then in the different presentations. Um, you, you may know that we, we launched recently the URE e-learning with the um, Geneva Center. So we'll also brief you on this because um, we think it, it really became a very good um, product with lots of NGOs and operators engaged in developing it. And, and I think it's really, really good. And um, after all these presentations, we will take questions. So we'll ask you to put them in the Q&A that makes it easier with a bigger group. And we'll have hopefully like 15 minutes at the end to go over questions and, and start a bit of a discussion. So finishing this, we will start with a topic where we think most people are really wondering, how are you doing this? So monitoring and evaluation of digital URE. And um, I'm handing over to my colleague, Kim uh, Fletcher from Halo Trust. Thank you very much, Sebastian. <laughs> and... All right, is that all working on your side, Sebastian? It is, thank you. Beautiful, all right, thanks so much. So the monitoring and evaluation of any type of remote risk education is always a challenge because for the most part, if we could access a community face-to-face -face for risk education, we would. So we have to assume for the m and &E that we can't always do our standard face-to-face -face surveys or our interviews or other face-to-face -face monitoring approaches. And so with that challenge in mind, a group of us on the Digital ERE task team set out to create some practical guidelines on how we can approach monitoring and evaluation when we're delivering ERE through digital means. And I'm Kim Fletcher, as Sebastian mentioned, I'm on the HQ m and &E team for the Halo Trust, and I'll be representing the team that created this content today. The other team members who created these documents are listed here. Um, so first, I just wanted to thank them for their work. But secondly, if you are a member of those organizations, they would be good people to start with for more information. So one of the things that we've seen as operators is that there are a lot of guidance documents out there that are dozens to hundreds of pages long with a lot about how you might do m and &E in theory, but not as much about how you would do it in practice. So what we've tried to do is create five very short documents. They're between two and six pages long about how you could approach the m and &E of the specific tools that are shown here. So there are quick guides that are now available for the ME of digital apps, of self-guided e-learnings, like the one that was just launched, of online delivery of interpersonal sessions, of SMS and messenger apps, and of messaging delivered on social media. And these documents are currently up on the EORE Advisory Group website, and they will be shared with this group with the summary notes that are sent around as well. So in terms of the content, all of the documents have the same basic outline. So they all include just a bit about the tool itself. So what do we mean by online sessions versus e-learning or what really counts as social media? And then they jump straight into some metrics of interest. So the guidance documents tell you what metrics are commonly built into the tool, like impressions versus engagement for social media or open rates and click-through rates for SMS. And then there's a brief discussion of how you might count beneficiaries in line with the sector-wide standard beneficiary definitions, and we hope in line with the proposed updates to IMAS 510 on minimum data requirements. 
And then after the beneficiaries and the built-in metrics, they jump into other recommended output metrics. And the last more monitoring focused aspect to look at is how you might measure successful engagement. So wherever possible, we've included in the document the typical conversion rates for each of the media, uh, which can then be used as a benchmark that you can measure the engagement of your own campaign against. So after the sort of output section, the document shift into more of an outcomes focus with a bit about how you might measure knowledge and behavior change. And for the messengers, the online sessions and the e-learning guidance documents, there are sample surveys that you can draw from as well. And then for all the tools, there's just a bit on some of the limitations of the tool itself and our thoughts on the limitations to the approaches to m &E that are discussed. So I'm not gonna go through the specific information in all five documents, but I thought I'd share some of what's in the social media guidance uh, first, because it is one of the more common digital ERE tools at the moment. And second, I hope it'll help illustrate the kind of guidance that you'll find in the other documents. So the first thing that's in all of them, as mentioned, is that description of what we mean by e-learning or SMS messengers or whatever delivery tool we are discussing. And when we're talking about social media, we mean tools that allow interaction, information, and content sharing among users. So it's platforms like Facebook, like Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. Um, we wouldn't include WhatsApp or Telegram in here because they would fit better under that SMS um, or messengers. On the built-in metrics, most social media platforms have several metrics that are built in as long as you're using the paid advertisements. And the most common things that you can track would be the number of impressions. And by impressions, we mean the overall number of views, even if the same person has seen the ad twice. The second one would be the number of engagements, which are things like clicks, like comments, or um, other ways of interacting with the messages. messages. And then there's the number of unique viewers. And one thing to keep in mind here is that it would be based on the user's profiles. So if multiple people in one household use the same account, it would show up as one viewer on the metric. And then the last thing would be the demographics of the user. So their age, their sex, their location, with that same caveat first that if there are multiple people sharing an account, you wouldn't get that breakdown. And also on social media, we found that people may lie about their ages for a variety of reasons. So your sex and age disaggregated breakdown might need to um, be taken with a grain of salt. And then for each of the guidance documents, we have this list of what metrics the tool includes and any warnings that we could think of that go along with using those built-in metrics. So in terms of counting beneficiaries, all of the guidance is based on that combination of the center beneficiary definitions for humanitarian mine action document and on IMAS 510 as it exists at the moment. Um, so in this case, that means that the guidance would be to count your beneficiaries using the number of unique viewers of the post disaggregated by sex and age with those caveats in mind that were mentioned before. And then if you have a video, it would be the number of people who watched at least 50% of it. Uh, also, following the standard beneficiary definitions, the guidance recommends reporting the social media beneficiaries or any digital mass media beneficiaries separately from your interpersonal risk education recipients if you are doing both. So a few of the other metrics that the document suggests keeping track of, if they're relevant, would be the percentage of viewers who are retained to different points in the video. So you have some idea of where viewers are being lost if they stop watching. Uh, the number of click-throughs, if you have things that they can click on, the number of people who take any associated surveys, and then your cost efficiency for any output metrics that you're interested in, like the cost per impression or the cost per engagement. And then you can also compare your viewers' engagement with the averages for the platforms you're using. So you can see here that in 2022, on average, each piece of content on TikTok was engaged by 2% of the people who saw it or who scrolled past it versus five hundredths of a percent on Twitter. So where we could, we included those average engagement levels in the guidance with also a heads up that those averages are going to constantly change over time. And they're also probably going to change based on the location and the targeted demographic groups. So you'd want to find updated figures for your location and for your demographics. But at least this gives you an idea of the type of figures that you want to find for your region and platform that you can compare your campaign against. And then lastly, for each of the tools, there are those thoughts on how you might measure knowledge and behavior change. 
So for social media, one of the useful tools that, that is mentioned is that you can do retargeted ads, which means that your second round of content or future rounds of content would only be shown to people who saw the, the initial rounds. So you can use that to put out like a knowledge, attitudes, and practice survey that will only be seen by those who saw the first set of content that you published. And of course, you can also do phone surveys or focus group discussions that are similar to the way that you would with face-to-face -face risk education or along the lines of what BBC Media Action has done in Afghanistan. So we've just gone through the content of the social media m and &E guidance, but the main takeaway that we want you to get is that we have these very short guidance documents on the m and &E of those five tools of digital EORE. So on digital apps, on self-guided e-learning, on instructor-led online sessions, on SMS and messengers, and on social media. And we are working on a sixth one for virtual reality at the moment. And those documents include those practical thoughts on how you might measure both the more common outputs and the more common outcomes related to risk education. So our hope is that they'll be used as a starting point. So if you are developing a digital EORE project, they'll be that jumping off point for your monitoring and evaluation. And they do include some additional links and references that we hope will get you going in a useful direction. Thank you very much. I will now pass it over to Celine and Audrey, who will be speaking about bite-sized content that the team has developed. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. And I hope you can all see this beautiful PowerPoint. Um, I am Audrey. I co-facilitated this uh, subgroup with uh, Celine Chang. And uh, the subgroup was dedicated to creating bite-sized contents, micro-contents, um, about projects, relevant uh, digital URA projects that were pertinent and that could be developed uh, and be of ins inspiration to um, all the DRA community. Um, we first created a community of, pra of practice and wanted to uh, create uh, content uh, for DRE operators and by DRE operators. Uh, we decided to build a very short and reader-friendly reader format, uh, about 10 slides, more or less, slides, sorry. Uh, and we decided also to tailor it to, tailor it to the needs of operators uh, in order to inspire and foster other digital risk education initiatives. Um, we also made sure it was endorsed by the EORI advisory group and you will have access to them um, online on the EORI advisory group uh, webpage. We developed five bite-sized contents uh, with uh, represented from different organizations and different projects. Um, and uh, you can see them here um, on the web page and access them. They are uh, right um, next to uh, the m &E, uh, fact sheets, the, the m &E tools that uh, Kim presented to you. And I will present you um, this first bite-sized content, which is about uh, EORE augmented reality application for children age uh, 6 to, um, to 11. They were created by DRC. Uh, this application was created by DRC Ukraine um, and was um, conceived as an extension of a coloring book with risk education messages. Um, and this in order to increase uh, the interactivity uh, of risk education sessions and boost information retention to complement more traditional face-to-face -face risk education uh, delivered in school. Uh, this project was developed thanks to a broad research uh, that the project manager uh, from DRC, Nick, uh, developed uh, because um, DRE um, literature was uh, very scarce at the time. Um, so he used, he used different, um, different scientific and educational literature to develop this project. Um, and uh, there were very uh, interesting key uh, takeaways that I really invite you to uh, check on the, on the EORI advisory group webpage. Uh, I will focus on two. 
that seem to me um, quite important. One is that when you start um, DRE project uh, and you need to partner um, with um, an organization that is specialized in digital uh, applications, for example, you need to ensure that uh, this company, um, that you dedicate time to this company to, to make, um, make them understand and to train them in uh, what is risk education um, uh, and, and what, you're, what you really want to develop in this project. And this should be included in the timeline of your project. Also, another key takeaway um, is that uh, even if augmented reality um, uh, implies a high cost uh, at the project start, um, it's uh, very easy to maintain afterwards. So this is something also that you can include um, in your budget from um, the project proposal stage. You can find out uh, much more takeaways and practical recommendations uh, online. Another uh, bite-sized contents that uh, we developed was with the Fundacion Barco uh, from Colombia. Fundacion Barco uh, made a very interesting alliance with Discovery Communications uh, and Discovery Channels, the, the Discovery Channel that you know, and uh, Colombia's uh, governmental educational program. Uh, this project was uh, really holistic. Um, it's a five years, five years, five years project, so it's a it's a very uh, dense um, and, and quite uh, intensive in terms of human resources. It has a big budget, but it was very interesting because uh, it mixed uh, different types of uh, media from TV and YouTube miniseries to radio spots, uh, and also from uh, educational video games to virtual reality and online courses. So this is a very massive and very uh, interesting project uh, that I really encourage you to read about in our bite-sized content. Uh, there are several um, takeaways that uh, you can um, get from this bite-sized content, but one of the most important is that um, DORE requires computer literacy um, and um, all organizations should include this component for children, especially in areas where they are not exposed to digital risk education, uh, sorry, to digital education. So this can be seen as well as an opportunity to integrate uh, digital risk education into broader development efforts um, through an educational perspective, for example, and to find corresponding part partnerships and sponsorships. Um, now I leave the floor to Céline, who will present uh, the three other bite-sized contents. Over to you, Céline. Okay, great. Thank you, Audrey. Um, you can move to the next slide, please. Um, and as Audrey mentioned, uh, I will be finishing the last three bite-sized contents that this subgroup has made. So uh, the first of the three bite-sized contents left was about the behavior change communication for EORE um, that was done by Unmas in partnership with Magenta Consulting, a specialized SBC uh, consulting company. It um, used SBC research to redesign Unmas's approach to EORE in Afghanistan after noting that despite having years of EORE, there was still an increase in number of accidents uh, in Afghanistan. So it uh, explains what was their approach, how they believe um, this approach made EORE more effective and efficient in Afghanistan, and it highlights the value of the partnerships between humanitarian organizations, uh, such as UNMAS, such as uh, our own organizations, and uh, private organizations as well. Um, next slide, please, Audrey. So the second bite-sized content uh, that I wanted to introduce was about the uh, EORE Facebook campaign uh, that was done by the Minds Advisory Group. This particular bite-sized content, or you can move on, uh, summarizes Mag's use of Facebook or what is now known as Meta as a digital platform. Um, and it also used uh, a few SBCC good practices to deliver EORE. So it extends beyond uh, what might be a more classical Facebook campaign. 
Um, it summarizes some key takeaways as well, uh, such as the effectiveness uh, in reaching targeted populations at a very relatively low cost, um, as well as its ability to quickly deliver in response to emergencies, uh, as well as in hard to reach areas as uh, we have seen before. And then the final bite-sized content uh, that was developed with this subgroup was uh, the EORE online courses, and this particular bite-sized content was developed by um, DRC um, in Ukraine as well. Uh, the purpose of the EORE online courses was uh, to help DRC reach inaccessible or hard to reach areas, noting that this project was done before the outbreak of conflict uh, that happened last year. Um, and so what's quite unique about this particular uh, online course is the use of pedagogy. They really looked at uh, science, technology, um, and uh, educational pedagogy to transmit information. Um, and as well as that, they used, um, they also created quite a number of partnerships with universities and other academic institutions to roll out these EORE online courses. Uh, so to summarize for all of the bite-sized contents, these are just very quick, very brief summaries that we have given. Um, all of the bite-sized contents, as Audrey mentioned, are available online on the EORE AG website and they contain a lot more detail. Uh, the authors of uh, the bite-sized content was not necessarily me or Audrey, they were a team effort by the subgroup and the author's names are listed on the covers of the um, bite-sized content. So if you are seeking inspiration, if you want to do a similar project, you're free to go and um, look uh, at these bite-sized content as well as contact the authors of uh, the bite-sized content for further information and detail. Um, if as well, uh, anyone would like to create their own bite-sized content, uh, they are free to contact Audrey and myself, and we would be happy to uh, walk you through the process and support in uh, the development of any bite-sized content, um, which would which could then hopefully be also shared and published on the EORE AG website with our community. So thank you. Uh, for that, and I'll now pass the floor to uh, Robin. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope you're all well. Just bear with me a moment while I share my screen. And if someone could be kind enough that you can confirm that you can see that. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I'm just going to spend a few minutes uh, talking about the work of subgroup number two uh, that has been working on a partner and platform mapping uh, over the past kind of eight or nine months uh, and how that will hopefully be able to benefit you and your work with Digital EOR going forward. Quite simply, and we had a bit of a change around trying to figure out the best way to try and support uh, the rest of our Oreo practitioners in the field as best we can with different solutions, but this is what we settled on. Uh, we developed a tool uh, that aims to better enable uh, digital EO practitioners to be able to identify suitable partners and platforms that can add value uh, to a whole range of different digital risk education activities. Um, so this is, uh, I'm simply a representative of the group. Uh, this is, uh, you know, what's been delivered is uh, due to a cumulative efforts of various people across different organizations over the past kind of year or so. Um, so big thanks to all of them for the continued support to bring this all alive. Uh, I think I may have excluded a couple of people who were part of the group earlier in the year. Uh, so my apologies to those, but thank you again for your contributions. Um, so very quickly, um, we've created a table, which I will show you in just a moment. Um, but it is it now analyzes 32 different partner uh, and platforms. Um, so these are digital uh, platforms or they are digitally focused organizations that can provide services uh, that enable you to deliver uh, or 
create or manage, report, or get training on uh, various things related to the delivery of digital risk education. Um, the table is categorized by a various number of different sort of options, including sort of social media, training, media partners, email chatbots, and a few different things. Um, it's meant to try and cover the, the a broad scope of the, the most common types of digital risk education and the different aspects of those. Um, so let me just flip over to the page. So if you do navigate to uh, the GICHD page for uh, the EOR advisory group, um, you can see it's just here. It's the Digital EOR Partnership and Platform Mapping. And if you open that, we will be presented with this table here. Uh, very simple to navigate, um, you know, from the left uh, to the right, organization, category, the coverage in terms of the, the geographical range that these platforms cover, uh, the about, quick background, introductory information of what these organizations are. Um, and then it breaks down to the three main columns of information in terms of what is the no cost functionality, what is available for free on some of these. And not every listed uh, partner has a free option opportunity, but many of them do. So on Facebook, for example, which I would just use as the, the main you know, benchmark, um, you know, you can create a page for free, you can create a group for free, you can post for free. But there is also some paid functionality on top of that, mainly focused around sort of the, the advertising on both Facebook and Instagram. But beyond that, there are also some partner opportunities available. Uh, a number of organizations, including MAG, Halo, um, FSD, have all benefited from the donation of ad credits at different points. Uh, and you can make an application or reach out to Facebook to try and secure that yourself. Uh, the next column uh, just has some quick uh, contact information of organizations that have used that particular partner or platform um, so that you can reach out for them for more information, a bit further guidance if you want, uh, and then a link uh, through uh, to the organization. So it's very just kind of top line information um, that will identify the different options uh, that all of these different platforms uh, can provide to you. Uh, and then links or information for people who might be able to kind of give you a bit more kind of guidance uh, as to what they have done there and then. Uh, so the next time you are creating a project, um, we would encourage you to take a quick look at the partner and platform table. Um, you know, as you are determining your needs of the target population and how best to reach them or what additional kind of skills or support or services you might need uh, to reach your objective. You can take a look over the table, uh, discover the different partners working in different spaces. So perhaps, you know, you are looking at a messaging app. Uh, you can see the different options there, whether it is WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Viber, Telegram, um, see some of the advantages or at least options that each of them provide. Uh, and then some information again, if you want to reach out to people who have used those in the past, who have all volunteered uh, their time to provide a bit of further guidance on requests. So thank you again to all of those people. Um, so yeah, so the next time you, you develop a project, just have a quick look at the table. Um, there might be some interesting information from there, some other opportunities you might not have been aware of, um, which guide you and hopefully strengthen uh, your next digital risk education project. Um, and then in terms of going forward, um, you know, uh, we've shared this with feedback before, um, really a big thanks to everybody who provided um, some feedback, but uh, anything further, then it can be directed through uh, Matt and Faustine at GICHD. Uh, welcome your improvements. Um, equally, the table is available for further um, submissions. So. Uh, if you have used a partner uh, or worked with a partner or used a platform that isn't listed, uh, we would very much appreciate if you could add that in for us. Uh, or uh, if you have worked on one of the existing platforms, particularly the ones where we only have a you know, maybe one person for contact or maybe we don't have a contact for, uh, if you could make yourself available for that, then that would be uh, much appreciated as well. 
Uh, and then we will try and keep this on an annual review. Um, so we will launch, uh, well, we kind of launched it already, uh, but maybe about sort of 11 months from now, we will take another look, review, make sure that the information's up to date, uh, and also, you know, evaluate what kind of usage it has for the, it's online. So one of those digital advantages is that we will be able to check how many people have used it and where they're coming from, that kind of thing, to try and give us a bit more kind of insight into, you know, whether it is providing a, a practical value to people and we should maintain this initiative. Um, so that is everything. Thank you very much for your time. Big thanks to everyone who has uh, enabled the project to come to life. Uh, sincerely hope it is of some use to people and I will now pass over to Matt. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Robin. There you go. So in the next five minutes, I will take you through two EORE e-learning courses that are available on the GICHD website. My name is Mathieu Laruel. I'm the EORE program manager at GICHD. But first, a few words on the process. The EORE e-learning courses are a clear and a practical example of uh, what can be done through a collaborative process between multiple stakeholders. So from the beginning to the end of the development of these two EORE e-learning courses, um, we worked very closely with EORE thematic experts from across organizations and regions. Some of those are online today and I'm happy to, to see them. We also involved experts in adult learning, instructional design, and also illustrators. So it is really the result of a collaborative um, collaborative work between different organizations. The OER e-learning consists of two complementary e-learning courses. So at the top here, you see the introductory module that was launched in July 2021 for a general audience. So when we mean general audience, we mean that it's a course uh, aimed at operational managers, country directors, colleagues from other sectors who don't know what risk education is, or people who are just starting in the mine action sector. So it will give them basic, a basic understanding of the core principles of uh, effective and ethical risk education. It is also a very effective um, advocacy tool uh, that you can use internally within your organization, but also with ministries you'd like to work with uh, or get the support on risk education. And at the bottom, you have the advanced ERE course that was launched in July this year. And this course is for ERE practitioners. So for people who, are, um, who work in our sector directly. So a bit more details on the two courses. So the introductory course has a dedicated trailer of two minutes that is available on the GSEHD YouTube, YouTube channel. It's a module that takes from between 60 and 90 minutes to complete. It's available in multiple languages. You have the languages there on the screen. We also have an offline version in English uh, for people who uh, work in uh, low bandwidth environments. And again, it is accessible on the GSEG training platform for which you have to create a login if you haven't uh, created one yet. Then the advanced course, similar to the first one, it has also a two minute trailer available on the YouTube channel. And this advanced course is longer. It takes uh, approximately eight hours to complete. It's only available in English for now. We're working on the French version, which will be launched in March, 2024. And this, uh, this course, as I mentioned earlier, is really for EORE practitioners, but also for protection specialists or people uh, who work um, close, more, more closely to, uh, to risk education. Both courses, as I said, are available on the GSEHD training platform. The advanced course has six modules that follow a standard project cycle that you can see on the slide. And you can pause and restart whenever you wish uh, and, and continue uh, com com completing the course at your own pace. The e-learning, both e-learnings also follow a red thread, which are um, the EORE core principles, the, those core principles that you see online that are aligned with the IMS 1210. And both courses uh, give 
issue or give a certificate to people who complete uh, who complete those uh, and who complete the final test with a minimum of 70%. So there is a pre-test and a post-test uh, to measure knowledge retention um, of, of users. The modules were designed to be accessible to as many people as possible, particularly to persons who are visually impaired, people also with hearing problems, and as I mentioned earlier, people, users in low, low bandwidth areas. So all images and videos that are in both e-learning courses were compressed. There's no text on images to avoid user, users using um, accessibility applications to miss key information. All videos are subtitled, they are transcripted, and they're compressed as well. And again, in terms of accessibility, we've done our best to translate at least the introductory module into several languages, um, Arabic, French, uh, English, Ukrainian, um, and currently, where, as I mentioned, we're translating the advanced course into French. We're closely monitoring um, the uptake of the course. So this is a summary of uh, quantitative indicators but mostly what we're seeing is uh, we're seeing an increased number of organizations that are, um, that are adopting or integrating the EORE e-learning journey into their uh, prerequisite for trainings uh, or on their onboarding processes, which is the ultimate, uh, the ultimate objective that we have. And the e-learning is also referenced into a lot of resource libraries from different organizations, not only in the mine action sector, but also uh, in other sector, in other sector, um, such as in the global protection cluster. So what is next? Well, we invite you to take the courses if you haven't done so yet and uh, to get your certificates. You can also share your achievements on social media. We encourage you also to add the e-learnings to your organization's resources uh, packages or on, on, on their websites. Um, a lot of organization presence uh, in this call have already also integrated, as I mentioned, the e-learning into the staff training as a prerequisite or in onboarding of new EORE practitioners. And uh, we also invite you finally to document those changes and share those stories with us to see if you can document in a way um, the changes that you observed following the adoption and the implementation of these e-learnings um, back in your country and uh, in your different country programs. So if you have any follow-up questions, just uh, send me an email and be happy to, uh, to provide more information on the e-learnings. And that's all for me. And I will hand back to Sebastian. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Concise, clear. Thanks so much. I thought that was very good and I hope our audience thinks so too. So we are looking for questions and um, there were not that many so far, but let's pick them up. And um, the first one is basically about the bite-sized content. If we have any plans to provide them in other languages. Um, so who wants to pick it up? Celine or Audrey? I can pick it up and Audrey can add if she would like to. So um, the, at the current moment, the bite size contents are in English. There is one bite size content on uh, child-friendly multimedia from Colombia that is also available in Spanish. Um, unfortunately, we, we have not uh, discussed yet translating it into any other language. Although if there is a very big demand for that, that's definitely something we could look into. Thanks, since I have you, Celine. Maybe you guys can help me. What is AR? Augmented reality. What does it really mean? What does it look like? Who can help me? Because we use all this jargon and there may be people on this call listening to us and just get lost in all these acronyms and stuff. Robin, you want to take it on? Cool. Uh, augmented reality is basically the blending of virtual reality with the real world. Uh, so rather than a virtual reality where you will separate yourself and put on a headset and experience something kind of quite separate to your real life space, augmented reality is trying to take these objects and experiences and implant them onto your kind of real world existing space. Uh, so for example, you can get an augmented reality app 
which you can scan certain things and it will create objects and you'll be able to interact with them and things like that. Uh, so it's kind of a, a more real virtual reality. That uh, And again, that it's a little bit more accessible because uh, normally you can use it just for a mobile phone, a regular smartphone, uh, and you don't need a, an expensive headset or anything like that. So does that make it an interactive tool? Because I'm seeing the next question. Is that the question? Is it an interactive tool? Yes, very it much. Sounds so. like it because you know yeah, you can you, you can manipulate uh, a virtual object uh, kind of in front of you using your smartphone. Uh, so, for example, this is just a fabricated one, but like theoretically, you could take a look at an explosive device and be able to look at it from different angles, things like that, uh, or explore a space, um, you know, through your smartphone. And it'll kind of appear. It's it's something that you kind of have to experience. Uh, maybe <laughs> just uh, I'll find a nice YouTube video that will maybe okay, thanks, slightly Robbie. better. But let me take up that question again because um, Enrique Abina he was asking um, how to manage such interactions. So, for example, if we have apps that um, allow us to report, and I think FSD did one, I think Halo tried it as well, and so on. So, the reporting apps. Um, how has this worked? What's the experience? And um, is there someone in our among us who could respond to this question? Any volunteers? I don't. Yeah. I think Halo has tried it, but unfortunately, I do not know enough about how that went um, to answer the question in a meaningful way. Sorry. No, I, I remember a bit, so I, I can try to add a bit. So the, the problem has been to, like, let's say Halo um, allows that to, to report, but then it comes from an area where NPA is in charge. We had that with Mac yeah, in, in Iraq. So the report comes from an area through Facebook and so on where we cannot respond. So it has to go through the National Mine Action Authority, and they then have to... Um, task someone to actually go. And, and this is such a lengthy process, it doesn't really um, work. So I think we have all, as far as I know, um, stepped away from using the, the apps for reporting purposes. HI, anyone remembers? Celine, anything? No, so I think that is the, the answer. The next one, you will have to read the question from the chat. What does that mean, R14? Yeah, I'm doing that. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have a question about learning course. All right. So I this can is take for that. You, Matthew. Yeah, I can take that one. Uh, thank you, Ako, for, for the message. The introductory module exists in Arabic. So that one is already available. The advanced course, since it was just launched now in July, um, because also funding and, uh, and and different priorities, we are translating the advanced course first in French. Um, but if there is uh, increased need to have it translated to Arabic, we could then would have to uh, embed it, that into the planning. But it would it would be for 2025 because it would not be possible in 2024. But point point well taken. Thank you. So maybe since I have you still, Mathieu, um, how do you really want to push out all these beautiful e-learning courses? You mentioned a bit, but do you have some ideas maybe also for our audience to really use it? You had mm -hmm. some. I think mm -hmm. we should repeat them. Sure, <laughs> Sebastian. I think uh, if I don't know if anyone in the in in this meeting has already taken the advanced course, you can maybe put raise your your virtual hands. Um, <laughs> but uh, I see some of my colleagues that have uh, who have their videos on. Thank you, Enrique. Fantastic. Uh, well, at the end of the advanced course, uh, we encourage people to do two things. One um, is to reflect on. Um, the, the, the learning, so what I have learned and how they're going to apply these, this new knowledge into uh, their daily jobs. Uh, so really looking at behavior change of learners. But we also encourage organizations 
to uh, take a conscious and strategic decision to use the e-learning journey and embed it into their compulsory training packages. Uh, it can be a prerequisite. So for instance, in GICHD, the EORE introductory module will be a prerequisite in our new, e in our new land release course, for instance. Um, it is also now a prerequisite for the UNICEF PFP global course that is happening in Switzerland now. It is the case also uh, for some trainings with HALO, right, Kim? Um, and I think it's the case for other organizations. So we really encourage you to have those discussions internally, see where it can fit within your, uh, you know, your training programs and embed it structurally. Um, and try and then and have maybe a baseline, define a baseline at the start to see if you, if you can observe any changes in practice over medium long term following the uptake of the course. And we have a, we have a series of examples that I would, I would be happy to share bilaterally with organizations that are interested. I don't know if that answered the question, Sebastian. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, trying to read Mahboub Rahman, a good tool for reporting. You, I, there's something on top of it. I can't read it. Reporting EO by the audience. EO, what you are? Can't read it. Ah, no, no. A reporting explosive ordinance. Yeah. I don't quite understand the question. Sorry. Perhaps I can as, as jump. A, yeah, go for it. Sorry, because I, I just saw that it might be related to bite sized content. So, um, just um, to clarify the bite sized content, uh, they are summaries um, uh, of key reports that have been published. Um, by different organizations or summaries of projects that have been implemented uh, by various organizations. Um, so it's um, not um, necessarily a reporting tool uh, per se. Um, I, I, would, I would say that the best reporting tool would be what is already available in uh, the context that uh, we work in. Yeah, thanks, Celine. Next question, where can we share if we have lessons learned, best practices and so on? So exactly, so that's the what Celine was just saying. I mean, the, the bite-sized content is a way to share it. And as was what Robin presented, we have this, um, the, the, the mapping and the, the tool um, with the, the partnership table, sorry, which is online on the URE AG website. And if you want to share like the, the products from, from Palestine, that's exactly the place where we can um, introduce them and share with others. And the bite size would really be a summary to, to share what you've done, lessons learned, et cetera. Can I jump in on that one too, since he mentions, um, or she, sorry, I'm not sure, mentions um, mm -hmm. working on evaluating the effectiveness of the digital productions. If you do want to create a guidance document, we by no means have like, the, the the ownership, I guess, of the ability to create those documents. So if you wanted to take that outline that we've made for the M&E one and show how you did the M&E of your project, we would be very happy to to take that too. So um, if you wanted to get in touch with me, I'll put my email in the chat and we can talk about how you might use that template that we have to create another guidance document for everyone. Yeah, we can link you to Hannah. Um, there's interesting projects really from the Gaza experience as well. And so, so three new questions, and but then I want to um, go to a closing topic. Um, Umas Iraq published SBCC study. Yeah, there were interviews and so, et cetera, exactly an evaluation kind of thing. Um, yeah, let's share this and exactly, let's try to use our URE AG website to share this kind of documents. Excellent, thank you so much. Audrey, Anya, okay, Celine, yeah, please share. And then CRS Vietnam, so Catholic Relief Services. Um, Mag, we've been working closely with you. Um, SBCC, yeah, so there's this one, uh, 
example that was presented uh, from, from um, Ukraine. And we are looking more into detail. Actually, Geneva Center is developing a toolkit at the moment um, on SBCC. And um, hopefully next year that will be available to everyone. Celine, you want to talk about that one briefly? You are muted. Yeah, I would love to, uh, Chow. I could talk a very long time about it. So what I will suggest, uh, maybe I will send you the specific bite-sized content uh, for that report, and then we can probably set up a meeting and discuss it bilaterally um, as well. Thanks so much, Celine. So we are ending and nearing the end of this uh, hour, and um, we would like to get ideas from you what this... DRE task team should do. Have we finished our job or is there more to do? Um, if you have any brilliant ideas, um, jot them in the chat and join us if you want, because we need fresh blood, new ideas. Otherwise, we're going to shut down the task team. And this will be also a topic then for the 15 minutes later. Um, if you guys think this is useful, and uh, we, but we need more of it, then tell us how to do it and join us. So, I mean, I've had, of course, I have some ideas and we have had them before already. Um, so one of it was actually when we thought about the task team to develop a training course on the digital EORE. So we held one workshop in, in uh, Switzerland, um, but um, that was only one off. And the idea is to maybe develop something more training on this or integrate it into other risk education training and so on. But this kind of training content, I think, is still missing. And last, there's a question on the IMAS. Is digital properly reflected in IMAS 1210 or not? Probably not, because we wrote it when uh, there wasn't that much digital out there. So um, other thoughts that um, if we want to update the IMAS 1210, it's pretty easy to ask for it but then we need people to do it. So that remains always the question, who does it? But you see quite a few active people on this call and we have active people. So let's see what comes next. Any final words from our panelists, please? Uh, anyone wants to join in? Matt Thank as you. our co-chair. Thank you, Sebastian. Christine. Yes, okay. thank you, Sebastian. Thank you very much. Um, and on behalf of the advisory group, many thanks to the Digital EORE Task Team and today's speakers for the presentations. Uh, and also, of course, thank you very much to the participants um, that were here today for your interest in the question, for your very interesting questions at the end, and uh, your open minds. Um, I just want to, to, to repeat again that you can find all the resources that were presented on the EORE AG webpage, and we put the link uh, in the chat at the very beginning of this webinar. So um, please go see the EORE Advisory Group webpage. You will find at the bottom this section on digital EORE, and you can find uh, the different mappings, you can find the different bite-sized contents developed, and you can find also the MNE metrics document. So you will see, uh, and, and in addition to that, you will also find like a lot of, uh, a lot other, like many more resources on risk education. So please feel free to go and check on the, the advisor group webpage. I just also want to share um, another information that we have another EORE hour planned on the 25th of October. So this one was the first one for 2023. And we are super happy, very happy to have uh, more webinars coming in October and November. So in October, the, the webinar will be hosted by HI on promoting safe practices in Iraq through EORE capacity building and alternative behavior projects. And more information to come soon uh, through the mailing list and through the International Mine Risk Education Working Group. So thank you again to the speakers. And now we will enter into the second part of this webinar, which is the networking circle. So we will stop the recording. The recording of the first part of this webinar will be available online on the EORE Advisory Group's YouTube channel at a later date.